you read about skeletons, how would you tell people that you personally? How would you decide? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. Sure. Hey there, YouTube, the Dapper Dino here, back to take more of Dan Biddle's nonsense apart. When last we heard from Biddle, he was complaining that things in prehistory are harder to date than things in history, as well as being apparently incapable of comprehending that some things are less a single event at a single moment and more of a long process, like the development of agriculture. But let's see what else he's got for us today. So now let's turn to the number one reason that students believe in evolution. We did a huge research survey of hundreds and hundreds of kids, uh, students actually between I think 18 and 25 asked them, what's the main reason you believe in evolution? And 72% uh, of, the, of them said that the number one thing was human evolution, then Darwin's theory, fossils and transitions, and science as an authority. But this is the big, the big one. You ask people why they believe in evolution, usually comes back to this. So even if you open up a sixth grade textbook, they say, well, look, we evolved from Australopithecines to Homo habilis to Homo erectus, and then on to Homo sapiens. Well, it's more complicated than that, but that wasn't a completely awful description of human evolution. It ignores a lot of the complexity going on in human relatives that are no longer extant, but I suppose if you want to ignore groups that have no living descendants, then yeah, other than the fact that Denisovans and Neanderthals do have living descendants, that's about it. Do you know, if you just look at over here, start with Australopithecines, you could take all of the 380 specimens that they have of Australopithecines and put them in a couple of Home Depot buckets. I don't even care if that's true. Who cares? Lots of bones can fit in a small container if you arrange them for maximum density. This has nothing at all about what it tells us about the organisms. No one thinks that Australopithecines are related to humans because we have literal mountains of their bones. That's it. That's all they have. Homo habilis, this one, I, I really had to dig in and research because it was terrifying what I found out. Really? Researching Homo habilis filled Dan with overwhelming fear? He was so scared that he ran screaming, literally? This is just murder of the English language. I asked leading experts about this to confirm it. Guess how many complete Homo habilis fossils they have? None. Yeah, because complete fossils basically don't exist. Guess how many complete T. rex fossils we have? None. Think about what it means for a fossil to be complete. It would mean that every single bone is there and sufficiently intact that we can reliably reconstruct every single one without any reference to related organisms. Basically, complete fossils don't exist. But so what? you fill in the gaps with other fossils of the same or a closely related taxon. As an example, let's say you found a fossil hominid that was missing the skull and the feet, but then you found another fossil of the same species missing the torso and the pelvis. Well, guess what? You haven't found a single complete skeleton of this organism, but you have all the bones anyway. So who cares if no single find is complete? That's what we expect. Now, I am exaggerating a bit. Complete fossils are found in Lagerstätten. But such formations are exceedingly rare, and to my knowledge, no hominid remains are associated with any Lagerstätte. A fact that's true for most fossil taxa. Zero. They have a hundred pieces of bones that they invented a taxon for, and said, well, we don't know where these fit, they look kind of human, they look kind of ape, so let's take these 100 little pieces of bones and invent a new taxon and call them Homo habilis, which means handyman. Okay, for this one, I turn to our resident hominin person, Gutsik Gibbon because she knows far more about this topic than I do. So rather than give my hot take, I ask for her scholarly and well-researched take. So here's what she had to say. The idea that Homo habilis, a very notable transitional species displaying morphology between that of Australopithecines and genus Homo, is simply a fake species composed of human and Australopithecine bones, betrays a level of desperation commonly reached by modern young earth creationists. Those who make this claim know very little about paleoanthropology, as many of the specimens of Homo habilis are represented by whole or partial skulls, and thus cannot be a mixed bone bag of multiple species. Occasionally, the skulls are accused of being fraudulent, as the accusers have not read enough of the literature to be exposed to the in-situ photographs of many of these transitional species still cemented in the ground where they were found. The skulls of Homo habilis are additionally not the only hominins that are mosaic in nearly every aspect of their morphology. Creationists must also contend with Australopithecus sedipa, Homo rudolfensis, Homo gautengensis, Homo georgicus, and Homo ergaster. Each of these species, documented extensively in their excavation, not only represents a morphology between the Australopithecines and genus Homo in brain case size, 
but also facial morphology, relative prognathism, suborbital bridges, dentition, and palate, and postcrania, derived pelvis, lower limbs, and hands, but basal upper limbs and ribcage. These species, represented by dozens of studies and specimens, cannot be written off due to inconvenience, although this is precisely what Genesis Apologetics attempts to do, as evidenced by their completely absent discussion of the paleoanthropology itself. But they don't have a single complete skeleton that's just an invented taxon, Homo erectus, or just humans, and then Homo sapiens. Homo erectus is a well-defined species, and it is not just short people or something like that. The differences are numerous, especially in the skull shape and size. There are differences in the orbit, the zygomatic arch, the brain case, the dentition, the shape of the tooth row, etc., etc. Check the sources in the description for more information about this, but suffice it to say that there is no competent paleoanthropologist who could even entertain the idea that Homo erectus and Homo sapiens are the same species. So that's their idea of millions of years of evolution. Here is Lucy. That's their best shot. Every sixth grade kid is, is going to spend a week or two learning about Lucy. She was only three and a half feet tall, about 60 pounds. Stands up real, real close to this uh, young gal here. Just a very, very baboon, chimp-like looking creature. First, baboons and chimps are not exactly hard to distinguish. You can't look like both except by being just broadly a catarine monkey, which includes humans too. Lucy looks nothing in particular like a baboon, but she does indeed look a bit like a chimp, which is to be expected as the common ancestor of genus Pan and genus Homo didn't live all that long before her, and so there wasn't that much divergence between the lineages. But significantly, she had a pelvis that was unsuited to knuckle walking like a chimpanzee, and a knee that was far too straight in alignment for a chimpanzee type of locomotion, but which was suited for upright locomotion. Significantly, however, it was less well adapted to bipedality than a modern human leg kind of exactly what you'd expect in a transitional form, a mosaic of traits of each bone. They only have about 40% of her skeleton that they found, so they found this. Here's the different skeleton pieces that they found, and then they drew this in, in school textbooks. Lucy is just one specimen. We have hundreds of specimens of Australopithecus, as Biddle himself admitted. Although for some reason, he has also decided to tell us how many trash bins they could fit in as if that had some relevancy. But that means that we can get a pretty complete picture of the anatomy of these animals. And so it is possible to give detailed skeletal and musculature reconstructions. Of course, integument, or skin and fur, is much harder and more speculative. Perhaps Lucy was as hairy as a gorilla or as sparsely furred as a modern human. We can't really know for sure. Creationists seem to have this thing for named individual fossils and what they can tell us on their own. But the thing is that, like in all science, the complete body of knowledge is far more important than any one find. If we completely obliterated the Lucy specimen, we'd still have a very good picture of Australopithecus anatomy at this point. So even if 40% were a small amount of a skeleton, which it certainly is not, it wouldn't matter. So it doesn't take very long to see the guesswork going into this. So now they've got her walking upright, they added feet, they added hands, they added all kinds of inferences about her, the slope of her face. Well, we know for a fact that Lucy walked upright based on the shape of her own pelvis and knee, and we have other skulls and hands and feet from her species to tell us how those parts of her anatomy worked. So I'm not seeing a problem here. They gave her a, a boyfriend and a kid. Very, very interesting Lucy. Well, we know Australopithecines in general reproduced, otherwise they wouldn't have existed. So it's not like showing a family unit is all that crazy. I mean, what next? Will you complain that they gave her lips, a feature shared by all Therian mammals? Seriously, nothing about this reconstruction is very speculative at all. It's just that this very conservative reconstruction makes Biddle uncomfortable because he knows that this is exactly the so-called ape man that shows that humans did in fact evolve from other apes and that they share a common ancestor with chimpanzees. Lucy was actually a quadrupedal ape that went extinct during the Ice Age. So about 4,000 years ago, and there's not many of them. Nope. Her anatomy precludes habitual quadrupedalism. Her arms are too short, her knees are too straight, and her pelvis too narrow. Now, she probably would have been better at moving on all fours than a modern human, but it was not her normal mode of locomotion. And further, as for the Ice Age, there isn't a single Australopithecine from any Pleistocene deposits. And since Biddle thinks that that age in geology corresponds to an indefinable time after the flood, that means that even though he ludicrously shortens the time frame involved, there is no evidence of Australopithecus in the Ice Age. They died out long before that, except for the ones that went on to found genus Homo. So Dan can't even keep his own pathetic excuse for a model straight. Uh, they they look very, very chimp-like. So, But I would think if human evolution had happened, that we would have lots and lots of these fossils. We do, by Dan's own admission. So he's just a liar now. He already said that we have lots of specimens, and now he's saying we don't. 
One of those times, he was knowingly saying something he believes is not true. But when you go look at, at Lucy in museums today, look what they always do with her eyes. Isn't that interesting? You ever been to the zoo and seen an, an ape with eye whites? No, because apes don't have eye whites. They don't have sclera like humans do. I can't remember if I've specifically seen a non-human ape with eye whites at the zoo, but they do exist, as you are all looking at them on screen right now. So unless the point is it doesn't count unless you have seen it yourself, which is a literal flat earth argument, then who cares? All apes can have white sclerae. They do that to exaggerate her human-like appearance. So every museum you go to, she's got eye whites and she looks like she's philosophizing somehow. So I don't know about philosophizing. I've seen some pretty pensive looking chimps and gorillas and even in person. But yes, the white eyes are there to make her look more human than she would without them. And the thing is, we don't know how accurate that is. We know that any ape can have white sclerae, so some Australopithecus certainly did, but we don't know if it was all of them, most of them, some of them, or what. But the thing is, we do know that because essentially all modern humans have white sclerae, and other apes have it only rarely, that the dominance of this trait had to come about after the split between humans and chimpanzees. The way we know this is called phylogenetic bracketing, where you use the distribution of some traits across well-established taxa to determine where the trait was gained or lost in evolutionary history. Since we can't really say more than that this trait was gained in the human lineage after the split, where we place it is arbitrary. So it's certainly not wrong to give reconstructions of Australopithecus these eyes, but it would also be fine not to. Very interesting. So let's look at Lucy's skull. It was sloped and ape-like. Do you see the brown parts here are what they found? The white parts are all imagination. That's all plaster of Paris. They only found these little pieces. The rest they completely guessed on. No, they are a careful reconstruction based on other skulls of members of the same species and a detailed knowledge of hominid anatomy on the part of the researchers. Plus, I can't imagine that Dan would want the skull to be more human. So what's the complaint here? And if you look at the slope of her face and the angle in which the spine entered the base of her skull, absolutely ape-like. Well, no. The foramen magnum, which is what he's talking about in Lucy, was placed at the bottom of the skull about the same as a human, but the angle of the opening was not the same and was more like that of a chimpanzee. This is again consistent with the idea that Lucy was a habitual biped, but less well adapted to that mode of locomotion than any modern human, exactly what you'd expect in a transitional species between basal apes and humans. And that really is the point. Lucy is a mosaic of basal and derived hominin traits in every bone. And also, while we don't have much of Lucy's skulls, we do have several essentially complete skulls from her conspecifics. Lucy walked at such an angle, or she had her, her face was so sloped that she couldn't have walked upright, because if she looked down, she'd be staring at her big nose standing out about right here. Yes, because as we all know, no animal with a snout can crane its neck down to look at what's going on under its feet. That's just impossible if you have a snout. Seriously, this isn't even an argument. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be one, or if Biddle here is dumb enough to actually take it seriously. But I'm leaning towards him just being stupid. So a very slope, then we also know from her foramen magnum, which is the hole in which their spine enters her skull, it came out about 18 degrees, just like chimps have today. Uh, no. <laughs> Chimpanzees have the angle of their foramen magnum vary from 18 to 30 degrees, whereas Australopithecus varies it from 14 to 20 degrees. So while there is some overlap on the low end of chimpanzees and on the high end of Australopithecus, it is clear that these species are not identical in the angle of their foramen magna. Oh, and unlike Dan, you can feel free to read my sources. They're in the description. So it was, and her slope is very sloped and ape-like, just, just like the apes today. So look at her field of vision there. She would have all this area she couldn't see because she'd be looking down the slope of her nose because her claim to fame is that she supposedly walked upright, but that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work too well. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought? Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. That field of view isn't going to get bigger if she walks on all fours. Her prognathic face is going to be there no matter how she walks. Like, I honestly don't even know what this point is. Uh, for Lucy. 
Here's a, just a, a chart from some secular research saying, well, this is chimps and Lucy's. Look at her spine comes in an angle there, which would force her forward into a forward hunched over position, walking on, on all fours. Humans were designed for walking upright and our spine enters in straight like this. Oh, hey, that same source was already in my list of sources before he even showed this slide. But oddly, that diagram of the chimp and human skull in profile doesn't occur anywhere in it. It's in a source both Dan and I used, and take a wild guess at the paper in question, the cranial base of Australopithecus afarensis, new insights from the female skull, agrees with me or with Dan. Yeah, if he has read this paper, then once again, Dan is lying. And if he hasn't, but he's presenting it as a source, well, he's lying again by citing a source he hasn't actually checked on. But also, up on the screen is the range of angle for the frame and magnum in these skulls, and it confirms that the ranges only have a small overlap and are generally quite distinct. Pro tip for creationists watching this. Stop putting up the evidence that debunks your own claim on screen. Make me have to hunt for it. In fact, Dan Biddle is pretty good at refuting his own claims on screen. He also did it in a video about dinosaur extinction. So look at the slope that chimps have in their spine, which is a, a slow shaped C here. We have four curves to our spine. It's called lumbar lordosis, which is how you need to displace all the weight in your spine when you're walking upright. They have a slow kind of a, a bend, a, a shaped C. So very, very much uh, chimp-like. But notice that he did not show a diagram of an Australopithecus spine. Weird, isn't it? Probably because none of the literature shows the spine being essentially identical to that of a chimpanzee. And they also know from, from skeleton or from skull scans that they've done on her semicircular canals that her posterior and anterior semicircular canals were only 50% the size of humans if you were to blow up her, her ear canal, her, her semicircular canals to be as big as humans. So much, much, much shorter. And guess what we use for, for balancing while we're walking upright? Those two semicircular canals. But it's also what other apes use in walking and climbing. So it's not like she didn't have a sense of balance, and being smaller doesn't necessarily mean not as sensitive. So I'm not sure what the point is, but I can't really figure it out because unlike me, Dan tends not to cite his sources. So, um, Dan? Citation needed, amigo. So many scientists doubt that Lucy was on her way to walking for that reason alone. He's either using the word many wrong or the word scientist wrong. I'm not sure which one. I guess it could be both, but the fact is that essentially all scientists in the field in question know that Lucy walked upright, albeit less efficiently than modern humans do. So they've actually learned that one of Lucy's uh, vertebrae did not even belong to her. Yep, the neural arches of Theropithecus thoracic vertebrae were initially assigned to the same specimen as Lucy. It's almost like all monkey vertebrae are similar, as if they're all descended from a common ancestor. But the thing is that we know that the hip, the knee, the skull, and the arms of Lucy weren't Theropithecus, because unlike an ambiguous partial vertebra of little diagnostic significance, those things are distinctly different from any baboon or even any non-ape, but are clearly the bones of an ape and a bipedal one at that. Lucy was sifted out of 20 tons of dirt over a 50 meter, 50 meters of dirt were, were sifted to find her over 20 tons of dirt. After looking through what literature is available on the internet, including the original paper publishing the find of Lucy, I can't find any evidence that this claim is accurate, but I also can't find anything contradicting it. But it is notable that many of these bones are too large for sifting to be necessary, so some aspects of Biddle account must be inaccurate. And the somehow bit is that when you find an associated bone and one of them is a morphologically similar bit of bone from another species, it's not hard to put it in the bunch. It's sort of like if you found the skeleton of a baby tiger in pieces. You didn't find the hand bones, but you did find the metacarpal of a similarly sized civet, so you included it in the find. Then a few decades later, someone comes and notices the mistake. That doesn't change the fact that you still have the skeleton of a baby tiger. This is what's happening here. And so they somehow accidentally included a bone of her thoracic vertebrae here belonged to an extinct therapithecus. So that doesn't sound, so if this part didn't belong to Lucy, I wonder what else doesn't belong to Lucy? Probably none of it, because the paper that found this one misplaced vertebra examined all the rest of the skeleton and found that it was all Australopithecus. And since we don't have any duplicate bones, there's no reason to think that the skeleton is comprised of the remains of more than one member of A. afarensis. And even if we were to find that a few more bones were misidentified, Lucy is just one specimen of many of her species. So it's not as if our knowledge of human ancestry depends on this one find. But oddly, the rest of the skeleton is consistent with other Australopiths, almost like the skeleton belongs together. 
which by the way, by presenting it as a single organism, the Creation Museum seems not to contest, even though they reconstruct the specimen in a knowingly inaccurate manner as a knuckle walker, when Lucy certainly couldn't have done this. You go to museums today and they all still have this bone here, but evolutionists had admit, yeah, that's a, that's a gibbon bone. It has nothing to do with australopithecines. A gibbon bone? I wonder if Dan knows that gibbons and gelata baboons aren't the same thing. Let's just say this. It's a good thing that Erica wasn't in this room, because I'm not sure Dan would have survived that after mixing up gibbons and gelatas. But yes, it does seem that most museum displays have not removed the offending neural arch yet. But that's museum displays for the public. And also, like I've said, it's not like this bone's inclusion or exclusion really changes any of the conclusions about the anatomy of Lucy. This find didn't prompt a re-examination of any reconstructed anatomy, because none of it depended on that one bit of bone. Especially since, even ignoring the other specimens of A. afarensis, we have other definitively non-baboon and definitively Australopithecus thoracic vertebrae from that specimen to work with. Dan is making a mountain out of a finding that changes literally nothing we know about Australopithecus, and then working it into some conspiracy theory about the whole specimen being a chimera or something, even though the very source he used to conclude the bone in question is from a different animal, concludes quite strongly that the rest of the specimen is in fact authentically that of an Australopithecus afarensis female. Um, now the paleontologists are actually arguing over Lucy's gender, and there's all these articles are coming out saying, well, is it Lucy or should we call it Brucey? It can be tricky to tell the sex fossils of ancestors. This one's a little creepy. This is out of the German of human evolution. And they say, Lucy or Lucifer? Gender confusion in the Pliocene. As in all things in science, we question our conclusions, so that if we are mistaken, we can be corrected. That's specifically why science is trustworthy, because it is always giving the best possible answer with the data available. Sometimes that conclusion is wrong, but even when it is, there are not better answers to be found until new data and testing come in. But while this was a bit of a question in the 90s, I can't seem to find anything recent contesting Lucy's sex. Also, I will say that it is a bit weird to call this debate gender confusion, like it said in that NBC article. But who cares? Either way, though, what challenge is it to the human evolution if the sex of Lucy was incorrectly identified? It doesn't make her not a bipedal ape with numerous skeletal features intermediate between basal hominids and modern humans. I mean, really, if Lucy had a penis, would that change anything about the transitional nature of Australopithecus? I can't see how. Mary, I wonder why they chose that name. That's kind of interesting. So they, they can't decide if it should, they should call it Lucy or, or, Lucifer, or Lucifer. So... It's because Lucy is a feminine given name meaning bright or shiny, and Lucifer is from the Greek for light bearer, and so they sound similar. And Lucifer is a masculine name. But even if that is some sinister plot to name a skeleton after the devil, so what? You can name things after the devil and it doesn't really change anything about the thing itself. Is devil's food cake evil because it has the word devil in it? Yes, yes it is. If you want to test this, next time you adopt a pet, name it Lucifer and see if that turns it evil. I have a strange suspicion it will not. They've also discovered from Lucy's wrist that she had a locking bone system so that she could, in fact, walk on all fours. No, they didn't, because Lucy's specimen doesn't have any wrists or hand bones, which Dan himself pointed out. But regardless, there is evidence of other members of Australopithecus, Afarensis, having adaptations in the wrist that are also seen in chimpanzees and facilitate knuckle walking. But these features are also gone by the time we get to Australopithecus africanus, a later and even more human-like species. Of course, this is what you would expect, for an only recently bipedal animal that descended from a knuckle-walking ancestor. Vestigial traces of adaptations to the previous mode of locomotion. It is strange that at some times, when Dan thinks it helps him, he'll pretend that Lucy is the only specimen of Australopithecus ever found, and that all of our knowledge of that genus' anatomy comes from this one find. But here, when he thinks he has a point about Australopith anatomy that comes from other finds, suddenly he's allowed to pull in data from other specimens. That's a nice double standard he's got there. Uh, she had a concave and convex locking system here. It's, it's where this little part of the end of your wrist bone locks into your hand structure like this so that you can lock it into place much like we lock our, our knees sometimes. And they have this little concave convex system here and humans don't have it. Humans are completely flat. We can't lock our wrists at all so we can't walk or run. But even in the picture here, the bone labeled Lucy is still intermediate between the more basal condition of the chimp and the more derived condition of the human. So when kids are going into the, the number one reason that kids go into the ER is because they fall back on a skateboard or whatever, some kind of wheeled device. They try to break their fall and they end up breaking their wrists because we don't have locking structures. 
just like what chimps would use to be able to walk on all fours. I'm sorry, so is Dan claiming that locking your wrist would prevent broken wrists? How would that work? It's not like the energy is going to just not transfer to the bones because they're locked in place. In fact, locking bones in place makes them more likely to break, not less, because the energy can't even partially dissipate by flexing the joint. Also, Lucy herself died falling out of a tree, so I don't think this adaptation is such a wonderful way to avoid falling injury. Also, I'm not sure how this affects anything about human evolution. It's just Dan being dumb for no reason. Uh, they also learned that her fingers were curved and ape-like, which would have really helped for her running around in, uh, in trees. Here's an interesting fact. The curve of ape finger bones, including humans, is subject to considerable phenotypic plasticity. Human gymnasts have curvy finger bones, and chimps raised in unnatural settings where they can't climb much have fairly straight phalanges. The curve tells you less about the genetics and more about the behavior of a particular ape in life. So what this tells us is that Lucy climbed a lot. What it doesn't do is negate her status as a transitional form. And over a few years ago, CNN just put this video out. It was based on a team of a bunch of forensic experts at the University of Houston that looked at Lucy's bones and determined that she had what's called green stick fractures in her wrist and on some of her leg bones because she apparently tried to brace her fall while, while falling 40 feet out of a tree traveling 35 miles per hour. But Dan, you just said that because of her locking wrist that she wouldn't break her wrist if she used it to break her fall. I guess Dan was just lying about that too. And honestly, I don't really like to say that someone is lying, but when they can't even keep their story straight across a few sentences, it's hard to find an alternative explanation. Dan Biddle is a liar. It's really hard to come to any other conclusion. Oh, he's also a copyright troll, and there's an extremely high chance that all the videos in the series will be fraudulently copyright claimed by his organization. So what is Lucy, the little ape that supposedly stood up and was walking like humans, doing 40 feet up in a tree, <laughs> falling down? And they said, well, yeah, we pretty much can confirm she was awake when she hit because she tried to brace her fall from whatever she fell out of, and her bones bent like a green stick and then splintered and snapped. She was probably doing the same things modern humans are doing in a tree, climbing. It's not like being a bipedal ape precludes climbing. Trees are a handy place to find food and avoid some dangerous animals that can't climb trees, like a rhinoceros or an angry elephant. Plus, climbing trees is fun. That's why kids do it. And that's why even adult humans do it sometimes. Additionally, humans also get injured falling out of trees. I don't see why this behavior shared by all apes, humans included, indicates that Lucy wasn't a transitional form between basal hominids and modern humans. It makes as much sense as smugly pointing out that Lucy had eyes. Yeah, we would expect her to. If she didn't, it'd be weird. Similarly, since all apes climb trees, it'd be weird if Australopithecus didn't. So that's what these forensic guys are, are saying. So that little ape is not walking around, she's hanging around in, in trees. Yes, at the time when she died. But existing at all ever in a tree doesn't make her not a bipedal, mostly terrestrial animal. Like, I can't imagine Dan has never seen a terrestrial animal in a tree. Bears climb trees, humans climb trees, Dogs sometimes climb trees. Even crocodiles climb trees. This is just a non-argument. Unfortunately, Dan keeps going about this one Australopithecus specimen for quite a while longer. But that will have to be something we finish up next time. Please remember to hit the like button if you enjoyed this video. If you didn't, please hit the dislike button and tell me what you didn't like. Either way, I hope you subscribe, hit the bell, and turn on all notifications so that way you're always notified when there's new Dapper Dino content out there. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. I just want to take a second to thank my channel members and patrons, especially those pledging $20 and above. Bob Knob, Bent Hoven, Ian Chen, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bede, Patrick Dennis, and Res Instance. My channel members and patrons help make this channel possible, and without their support, this channel really wouldn't exist. If you would like to help support the channel as a member or patron, there are links in the description to both join the channel as well as join the Patreon. Patrons and members get mentioned in these credit scenes, as well as getting early access to my scripted videos, and if you pledge $10 or above, you can also get access to various 3D assets that I create for Blender, both for use in the channel, as well as just general giveaways to my supporters to help in any Blender projects they might have. If a monthly or annual pledge isn't for you, then there is also a merch store linked in the description. And if none of that's right for you, please just like and subscribe because every like and subscription really helps the video out. Thank you.